Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I want to welcome you all to our Independent Policy Forum this evening. The Independent Policy Forum is a series of lectures, seminars, and debates that we sponsor here in our conference center in Oakland. As many of you know, the Independent Institute regularly sponsors programs featuring outstanding scholars, policy experts, and other renowned figures on major social and economic issues, and tonight is certainly no exception. Our program tonight is entitled Global Warming, Scientific Fact or Fiction, or perhaps Scientific Unknown in some respects. Um, our speaker, as you know, is Dr. Fred Singer, who is the author of the book that we publish called Hot Talk Cold Science. This is actually the revised edition that uh, many of you have picked up. The book is is an extract from a larger, more technical work that Dr. Singer has been working on for us that we're planning on publishing in the future. For those of you who are new to the Institute, uh, hopefully you received a registration packet which explains to you about our program. The Institute is a nonprofit, non-politicized scholarly public policy institute. We sponsor many studies, as I've said before. We involved uh, scholars at universities in the United States and around the world in doing such work. The results are published as books and other studies, as well as our quarterly journal, The Independent Review. And for those of you who have not seen copies of the journal, uh, there are copies upstairs. I should mention that um, an important article on the issue of global warming and the climate treaty appeared in the journal about a year ago by an economist by the name of Bruce Yandel. In your packets this evening, and um, uh, also for those who follow us on our website, you may uh, want to note our next event, which is going to be March 7th, and this is a, a card on it, which will be going out, I think, today or, or tomorrow. The topic is on a completely different subject. It's on the subject of pro-team sports, but our angle is a bit different. Uh, our angle is to look at the issues of the politics and economics of pro-team sports. The public policies affecting coliseums, uh, the public policies affecting many aspects of protein sports. As I'm sure many of you know, there's increasing questions about the kind of deals that are arranged that taxpayers then end up putting the bills for, uh, and many other aspects of that. The speakers for that will be Roger Knoll, who's an economist from Stanford. He's co-editor of the book Sports, Jobs, and Taxes from Brookings and Rodney Fort, who's professor of economics from Washington State University, who is co-author of the book Hardball. And we hope that you'll be joining with us for that event. That's March 7th. And one other point I should mention is that um, the programs we've been holding have been starting at, the reception starts at 6, and the event uh, usually starts around 6.30 or so. We've decided to move that back a half an hour for those from outside the immediate area uh, who try to get here. So we'll be starting one half hour later in the future. For this evening, we are delighted to have one of the really preeminent authorities on energy and environmental issues. He's a pioneer in the development of rocket and satellite technology. Dr. Fred Singer designed the first satellite instrument for measuring atmospheric ozone and was a principal developer of scientific and weather satellites. Our topic tonight is really one of the most contentious issues around today. It's one that's highly debated, but not that many people really know much about it. What is global warming, and what are its precedents? Is global warming today a reality? Is global warming imminent for the future? Is global warming a threat to human life? Have such predictions been established scientifically, and is there a scientific consensus? The proposed global climate treaty calls for extensive government measures, including tax policies and other, other policies. With the proposed use of so-called carbon taxes and other controls make societies in the West and in the developing world at a safer situation or at greater risk. Fred Singer is a research fellow here at the Institute. He's also president, his major position is president of the Science and Environmental Policy Project. He is Professor Emeritus at, of Environmental Science and a member of the Energy Policy Studies Center at the University of Virginia. He's a distinguished research professor at the Institute for Space Science and Technology. 
Harvard. He received his, his PhD in physics from Princeton University, and he's a recipient of the White House Special Commendation, Gold Award Medal from the U.S. Department of Commerce, and other awards. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, he's received an honorary doctorate degree from Ohio State University and was elected to the International Academy of Astronautics. Uh, the list just goes on and on. For example, he served as vice chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Oceans and Atmospheres. He was chief scientist for the U.S. Department of Transportation. He was deputy assistant administrator for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, deputy assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior. He was the first director of the U.S. Weather Satellite Service, director of the Center for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Maryland, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, Fred has such extensive background and knowledge in this field, it's uh, really quite, quite exciting to have him here. Um, he's also the author of, or editor of 14 books in addition to Hot Talk Cold Science, as well as many technical articles in uh, scientific journals, as well as uh, many articles in popular publications ranging from the Wall Street Journal to the New Republic. Uh, I'm very pleased to present Fred Singer, um, and after his presentation, I'd be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you, David, for this very nice introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here, particularly since I see in the audience a number of people who uh, were friends of mine going back, uh, shall we say, several decades. And uh, it's always great to, uh, to, to see them again. Uh, the subject tonight uh, is an interesting one and a contentious one. And I can think of no better way to introduce the subject than to cite uh, a great authority, namely the President of the United States. <laughs> and here's what uh, William Jefferson Clinton said in his uh, State of the Union message just a short while ago. He said, global warming is the single greatest ch challenge to humanity in the coming century. That's what he said. I also want to cite another authority who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, a dear friend of ours, Professor Wildowski, Aaron Wildowski, who some of you may know and remember, a uh, professor at the University of California at Berkeley, who said that global warming is the mother of all environmental scares. You can take your choice. Um, it certainly is an interesting topic, which has both scientific, economic, and political aspects. This is going to be a, a talk that probably will not last all night. <laughs> Please don't worry. I will try to touch on some of the scientific topics. I'll summarize, if I can, our view of the scientific situation, but warn you that it is contentious, that scientists are divided on many of the issues. And this is why uh, the book that I wrote for the Independent Institute is called uh, it refers to a scientific debate. Uh, David uh, Thoreau here is responsible for the main title, Hot Talk, Cold Science. Right, for which I thank him. He called me long distance. I was in Barcelona at the time and said, is it all right to you change your title from uh, uh, Global Warming's uh, Unfinished Debate to Hot Talk, Cold Science? I said, well, you look... If you think it'll sell better, why not? <laughs> so we kept both titles. I'm very grateful to him also for suggesting initially that I write such a book. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit of a push to do that. I, I tend to write short pieces, and the book is book is a tremendous, tremendous undertaking, if you've ever done that. I thought tonight what I should do is to divide my talk into three parts. Why three parts? Well, as I told people earlier, when I was a boy, uh, I had to study Latin. And one of the things I had to read 
was Julius Caesar, the Bello Gallico, the, 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 the wars in Gaul. And it starts off by saying, Gaul is divided into three parts. And I've always remembered that. And ever since then, everything that I do seems to be divided into three parts. Anyway. Can you can you sort of see this from where you're sitting? My uh, probably I'm probably in the way. Can you hear mind. me all right? Anybody just raise your hand if you cannot hear me. Is the mic on? I don't know if my mic is on, but they can hear me, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Am I still on? The mic is not on. But, it, but, it, but I'm getting across. Okay. Well, you know, if you put a man on the moon, then... So. <laughs> I also have with me um, a advanced technological device that I would like to demonstrate for which is now I think going to supplant the laser pointer which so many people use and uh, here it is it was given to me by a meteorologist Alan Robach in a debate we had and he said I don't admire it so much he gave it to me and he said use it carefully <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, it is really more now there have been laser pointer, laser pointer, it's so impersonal. Uh, I, I try to uh, put my presentation into three questions, and I'm afraid my answer to all three questions is no. Let's let's talk about them. First, before we do anything in any detail, this is certainly the most important question is, is there really a man-made, a human-made global warming that we can discern, that we can see? That's a very important question. And I'm afraid here I must depart from some of the uh, material that you may have read in the newspaper. I don't think we can see it yet. It's not just, do we see a global warming? That's one issue. Sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's cool. The climate is always changing. You know, people sometimes ask me, uh, you know, is the climate warming or is it cooling? And my answer always is yes. <laughs> uh, it all depends on the climate of what you say. Certainly, uh, the climate has cooled since last July. We know why that is. We can explain that. <laughs> Certainly, the climate has warmed in the last 15,000 years. You know why that is? It's the end of the ice age. 15,000 years ago was the peak of the ice age. It's warmer now than it was 15,000 years ago. So warming by itself doesn't mean that it's caused by human activity. And to be able to say that a warming that takes place is actually due to something made by humans, that's a very difficult question. And I'll come back to that because it is a very important question. The second question, are uh, warming consequences how much of society? Uh, the answer is as long as the warming is moderate, certainly not. In fact, it is beneficial. And I'm trying to demonstrate that through the work of, that's been published by economy, a leading economist, and other kinds of uh, issues that have been published that will make this, uh, will make this quite, quite, quite clear. So any uh, discussion that says that warming is harmful is probably not justified. I remind you, for example, that only 25 years ago, in the 70s, there was great concern about global cooling. Some of you may remember that. I see a lot of uh, gray heads. They might have the same color. Yeah, I have. Shake your head. Yeah, I remember that. And same people, that are, some of the same people that are now concerned about global warming, the then concerned about global cooling, asking the government to do something about it. 
Stabilize the climate, if they said. How do you do that? Now, the last question is a political question. Now, there has been uh, considered something called the Kyoto Protocol. Now, the Kyoto Protocol is a uh, political document arrived at in Kyoto, Japan, in 1997. It calls on industrialized nations, like the United States, to cut their emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, which is a gas produced whenever you burn fossil fuels, that is, whenever you burn coal, oil, or gas, you emit carbon dioxide. And since carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, according to the theory, the greenhouse theory, it is supposed to warm the atmosphere. And to avoid that, because the Kyoto people thought this was harmful, uh, they insisted that we cut our emissions of greenhouse gases of carbon dioxide. And even though the goal for the United States is only 7%, this refers to the 1990 level. By the time this goes into effect, which will be 10 years from now, roughly 2010, this means a 35% cut in energy use. 35% cut. Which means that you have to cut your energy use by one third. So if you use your car, Six days a week, it means you should only use four days a week. But if the temperature in, in your house is 72 degrees, it means it probably should be more like 60 degrees. Well, you can sort of see what this means. It is a severe cut in energy and would have very bad consequences, uh, not only for consumers, but also for industry, which would probably be forced to move uh, to countries like Mexico or Brazil or China or India that are not required to reduce their energy use. Only industrialized nations would be required to do this under the Kyoto Protocol. And therefore, my answer is that it's politically not feasible. In fact, the U.S. Senate has already pronounced itself in a vote of 95 to nothing, 95 to zero, against any agreement that would impose these kinds of economic penalties on the United States. However, and now comes the interesting part, the future of the Kyoto Protocol depends very, very much on the forthcoming presidential elections. It turns out the Kyoto Protocol is really the brainchild or godchild of uh, Vice President Dago. And his reputation and his whole being is tied up with the issue of global warming and the Kyoto Protocol. And if he's elected president, he will certainly, certainly push for a passage or ratification of this treaty. It has to be ratified by the U.S. Senate by two-thirds, by two-thirds majority. And it, it may be successful. On the other hand, if he's not elected, any other uh, candidate is elected to the office, whether he be Democrat or uh, Republican, Bradley or Bush, who does not have his uh, the ego tied up with the Kyoto Protocol, the chances are very good that it will never be ratified by the U.S. Senate, in which case it will never go into effect globally because the Kyoto Protocol depends entirely the way they set up on is the U.S. ratification. So I've tried to lay the groundwork here for what I want to discuss, and now let's uh, look at some of the uh, first the scientific issues, then some of the economic issues, and finally I want to end up by discussing who, are, who and why are people really supporting the Kyoto Protocol, in spite of the fact that there's so little scientific support, in spite of the fact that global warming consequences are really not harmful. It may in fact be beneficial. Do this. I will uh, try to manipulate things a little bit here. Let's see if I can. That's a bad word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do uh, a little bit of uh, this and try to find uh, the rest of the slide. Here they are. Good. Uh, 
I'll start by projecting for you the report, the cover of the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations panel that advises the United Nations on the issue of climate change. It's a group of scientists, about 80 to 100 of them, who've written this report. Many more have uh, commented on it, including myself. <laughs> Even though our comments may have been uh, at, at times critical of the report, we're still listed at the end of the way we count, they count us as consenting scientists. <laughs> That's a small detail, perhaps. This report <laughs> actually was published in 1996, and I'll have, a, I'll have a lot more to say about this. But this report forms the foundation, the scientific foundation and rationale for the Kyoto Protocol. Now, the best answer to this report, I will have to admit, is my own book, <laughs> which many of you now have, thanks to the fact that you are here tonight. So you can read about the shortcomings of this report, and particularly of the summary, <coughs> by looking at the book. Many of the uh, data that I will present tonight are, in fact, in, in the book. Uh, you will recognize some of the data, some of the graphs, and some of the discussion. Now, the way to get perspective on this whole issue of climate change, from a scientific point of view, is to ask, what's happened in the past? Fortunately, we have quite good data of what's happened to the Earth in the last, let's say, 600 million years. In the Cambria, for example, 600 million years ago, we have our first fossils. We can actually uh, determine what the temperatures were. We can determine what the concept of the atmosphere was like, and we know more or less what was going on. So people who are concerned about the increase in carbon dioxide that has taken place in our atmosphere in the last hundred years, let's say since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there has been a, about a 35% increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere due to human activity. We need to look and see what's happened in the past. If you do that, and here is a uh, <coughs> sort of summary of data from a respected scientific publication. You see that 600 million years ago, which is the beginning of the uh, beginning of the uh, uh, fossil period, where we actually have fossils and we do some real measurements, 600 million years ago, the concentration of carbon dioxide was about 18 times what it is today. 1,800% higher. And then it decreased, and then increased again about 200 million years ago, and it's been decreasing ever since. That's what the data show. So, uh, a 30% increase in carbon dioxide is, as we say, no big deal. <laughs> as far as the Earth is concerned. <clears throat> but we're trying to understand why it decreased, why it increased here, but I would like to just point out that the continuing decrease of carbon dioxide in the last 200 million years is something we should worry about. And the reason is that carbon dioxide is what plants live on. The only way plants can grow is by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's plant food. The carbon dioxide levels drop too far down, plants die, and then of course animals and human beings will fall. So the basis of all life is to have enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and a small increase in carbon dioxide, as we're experiencing now, is in fact a boon to agriculture, to forests, and to all plant life. I should point out one more thing, that during the, these last 600 million years, there have been many glaciations, many events when the Earth was covered with ice. There was one 400 million years ago, when levels of carbon dioxide were extremely high. So the relationship between carbon dioxide and glaciation, or temperature, is, is not very clear. There are many, many occasions when you have very cold periods, 
when carbon dioxide can be very high. Even though carbon dioxide is, as we all know, a greenhouse gas which would tend to raise temperatures. What about temperatures? Well, the temperatures of the Earth have varied all over the place. They've been hot and cold and varying. The temperature is never constant. The climate is always changing. Uh, I think you all know about the Ice Ages. The Ice Ages started about two million years ago. There have been 17 of these Ice Ages that we can identify, lasting on the average about 100,000 years. In between these Ice Ages, we've had warm periods or interglacial. Right now, we are in a warm period. Our last Ice Age stopped about 15,000 years ago. The next Ice Age should start very soon. Maybe in the next hundreds of thousand years. We don't know. Because we don't understand completely the theory of Ice Age formation. There are many ideas, but nothing is sure in this business. I'd just like to show you and this is from the IPCC report, a sort of a, a general view. Uh, I apologize because it's one of those confusing graphs. But the main point that I want to bring out is the climate has been varying. This is temperature. Up and down, this is the ice age, this is the warming. In the last 10,000 years, temperatures have moved up and down. But let's look at the last 1,000 years. And the reason the last thousand years are interesting is because we have good records of what happened in the last thousand years. You see here it is, 1000 AD, 1100 AD. This is the period when the climate was quite warm. It's called the medieval climate optimum. This was the time when the Vikings were able to settle Greenland, actually grew crops in Greenland, explored Labrador, there's a myth going around that they were able to grow grapes in Labrador. They even produced fine wines, so they say. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> the historical records are not quite clear, but the, the Greenland colony certainly did exist and was thriving. And <laughs> that's why it's called Greenland, even though it's covered with ice now. What happened then was we entered a period called the Little Ice Age. Little Ice Age because it was not a complete ice age, but it was a, a strong cooling, which uh, caused many crop failures in Europe, where we have good data. Uh, people starved, died of disease because of malnutrition. It was a really tough time. It led to many wars, because when people don't have enough resources, they try to steal them from their neighbors. Around 1850, Temperature started to increase again. The end of the Middle Ice Age. Another recovery of the common Ice Age. And now, from about 1850 on, we have quite good climate record based on real temperature measurements. I'd like to show you what is called the standard temperature curve of the last hundred years. Pay no attention to the, this curve. These are, these are changes in temperature from some arbitrary level. These are not the real temperatures. These are changes from some arbitrary baseline. What is important is the temperature started to increase and increased very rapidly between 1920 and 1940, as you can see. Reached a peak around 1940 in World War II. The rate of change. The rate of change. No, no, this is the actual temperature referred to some <coughs> not the rate of change. And then after 1940, the climate cooled, in spite of the fact that energy production really rose after World War II. That's when people started to use energy on a large scale. That's when fossil fuels were burned at a large rate. So in spite of the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is documented, temperatures fell. 
Yeah, I think you recognize this is very, very embarrassing for the theory. <laughs> you know, according to the theory, temperature should increase more rapidly after 1940 than before. But they didn't. They cooled. This is an important clue. It shows that uh, the effects of carbon dioxide, while they theoretically are there, in reality are very small or very insignificant compared to natural fluctuations of the climate. Then again, suddenly the climate warmed in 1975, as you can see, and I've stopped in 1980. The reason I've stopped is because the subject has become extremely controversial. And now I have to tell you what's happened after 1980, the last 20 years. It's a very interesting story. In the last 20 years, the surface of the Earth seems to have warmed, according to measurements with the surface thermometer, most of which are at weather stations or airports. But when you collect them all, it is showing a distinct warming of the planet. Strangely enough, since about this time, we've now had weather satellites measuring temperatures globally, measuring temperatures of the atmosphere above the surface, and they show no warming. We also have a third method of measuring temperature. Perhaps you've seen these weather balloons that rise up into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. carrying instruments that measure temperature, the so-called radio song, they radio the data back to the Earth. So they measure temperature very precisely as they go up in a number of places around the world. And those measurements also show no warming. So the weather balloon data and the satellite data agree that the atmosphere has not warmed. But the surface data show warming. What are you going to do about this? Well, we do what every good scientific organization does. We appoint a committee. <laughs> this is a committee of the National Academy of Sciences, which came out with a report just three weeks ago. Brand new result. The report is called Reconciling Observations of Global Temperature Change. In other words, how do we explain the fact that the surface is warming and the atmosphere is not warming? Very, very difficult problem. Well, in true uh, uh, Solomon-like fashion, they, they said, well, they're both like. <laughs> the surface is warming and the atmosphere is not warming. They couldn't quite explain why that is so. I mean, it, after all, the atmosphere is a fluid which tends to equalize temperature. How can you have a surface warming and the atmosphere not warming? Well, they make a few suggestions, but they finally at the end say, well, we can't quite explain that. There is a real discrepancy. And now comes an interesting point, which I think you might appreciate. It's a political point. How was this result this presented to the public? Well, it was presented in a form of press release. We said, no, we know that the surface is warming, the climate is warming. That's what the newspapers were told, and that's what they said. The real result, which was not communicated, is that for the first time, the skeptics of satellite data, who have been fighting them for some years now, had to agree that the satellite data are okay. The atmosphere is not warmer. That is the new result. The atmosphere is not warmer. You don't quite know why there's such a difference. You have some ideas, but the atmosphere is not one. And both the balloon data and satellite data agree on that. But that was not reported to the public. Yet that's the conclusion of this report. Now, uh, I can quote you from the very funny uh, web page I have here. But I'll, I'll resist the temptation because time is a little too short. I'll give you the reference. Just you might well enjoy reading it. There's a web page here. It's called The Washington Pest. <laughs> Most of you will know that we live in Washington, you know, the Washington Post. So this is a spoof on the Washington Post. It's called WashingtonPest.com. 
Right it does. Washington Test, one word, dot com. The Washington Test, one word. Washington Test, dot com. And the issue is the one of January 24th. It's called Climate Science Finds Hot Air. <laughs> I can't resist. I have to quote you one, one, one sentence. This is supposed to be, it's a fake interview between a reporter from the Washington Test and a uh, science expert who is supercilious called uh, Artemis P. Archipelago. <laughs> and uh, the reporter says, what's going on? I don't understand it. And Archipelago says, it's really a very simple issue, you dumbo. There are two temperature records for the great mother Earth. The lower temperatures and satellite temperatures. The thermometers, while well, down to Earth, are going up. The satellites, while well, up, are not going up. Get it? <laughs> it goes on like this. It's really Great school. Great school. Anyway, to make matters a little more interesting, let me tell you what the theory has to say, the greenhouse theory, the one that we rely on to make predictions about the future, the climate model. The climate models say that the atmosphere should warm more rapidly than the surface. <laughs> this really presents a big problem. It means that either the surface data are wrong, or the models are wrong, or they're both wrong. I think they're both wrong. So now I will try to show you why the surface data might be wrong, and why the climate models might be wrong. And this is important because we rely on these climate models to predict what might happen in the next century, or this century, not this century. The most common assumption about the surface data is that they're contaminated by what's called the urban heat island effect. Most of these thermometers that measure temperatures are located near air at airports or near populated places, and these populated places are growing in size. And they're warming up. Because they have more people, more cars, more traffic, <coughs> and so on. We all know that the cities are warmer than the countryside. And that is called the urban heat island. And after a while, all of these thermometers are surrounded by people. And they're warming up. And that's an artificial effect. It's just a local effect. It's not a global warming. To demonstrate this, we should look at California. California is one of those lucky places that has more weather stations than they know what to do with. Uh, apparently you have a surplus of money, or at least a surplus of tax revenues, which has been spent on weather stations. California has 107 weather stations in 1909, and I don't know how many they have now, probably a lot more. But um, Jim Goodrich, who's a climatologist in Mendocino, has plotted up the records for the weather stations of California, dividing them into three parts. The weather stations, <laughs> right, in, in, <laughs> thank you, the weather stations in counties that have more than a million, the stations in counties that have between 100,000 and a million, <laughs> And those that have less counties have less than 100,000. And lo and behold, when you do that, you find that temperatures in the last 100 years have increased in the counties that have more than a million, increased slightly in the intermediate counties, and have not at all increased in counties that are sparsely populated. It's a very strong demonstration of the urban heat island effect. It's still disputed, but I think it is powerful. There's more other evidence by the way, which is mentioned, is mentioned in the book. Now, when it comes to the models, we have a problem. The models, you see, are trying to simulate what's going on in the atmosphere. Look, well, that's a very difficult problem. The atmosphere is very, very complicated. For example, the models cannot simulate the clouds. Now, why is that? Well, because models are very crude. They calculate conditions at distances of around 200 miles to 300 miles apart, not at every point in the atmosphere. That would take so much computing power that the models would have to run for several centuries. You don't have the time or money for that. Well, if you have uh, something that calculates at every 300 miles, you obviously cannot represent a cloud 
which is much smaller, or even a cloud system. So they have to approximate things. And unfortunately, when they do this, they don't know whether the clouds will increase the warming or decrease the warming. Don't take my word for it. I will give you the opinion of the leading scientist who has been supervising the modeling in Great Britain and also for the IPCC, for this UN group. Now, this is what he said in an interview. Cloud behavior is the single biggest uncertainty. Researchers cannot be certain whether clouds speed warming or slow it. Now, that's a real admission. Ladies and in 10 years' time, he thinks he might be able to say more. So give us more time, give us more money, and maybe we'll give you an answer. Maybe. Look, it's a difficult problem. I'm not, I'm not denying it. But what, I, what the lesson from this is, if you cannot, at this time, place any reliance on the climate model, if they cannot simulate the clouds, which are really very important in determining temperature changes, so then you really don't know which way the climate is going to go. Even more important, and I'm trying to bring up another technical point, is water vapor in the atmosphere. Now you all know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. You should become aware of the fact that water vapor is an even more important greenhouse gas. 95% of the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere is due to water vapor. The reason you don't hear much about water vapor is because human beings do not make water vapor. And so we can't control it, and therefore it's never mentioned. But it is the most important greenhouse gas. And one of the difficulties is that the models, the climate models, don't know how to deal with water vapor. Again, don't take my word for it. What I've done here is I've accumulated three different quotations from the three different IPCC reports of 1990, 1992, and 1996. And as you will see, they're gradually learning that water vapor is a problem, it's a serious problem. Unless they know how to deal with water vapor, they don't really know how to predict the climate. These are their quotes. As you can see, in 1990, they said water vapor is very easy, it's just intuitively easy to understand. That means water vapor in the models amplifies the greenhouse effect, amplifies the temperature change. By 1992, they admitted there might be some difficulty with water vapor in the upper troposphere, which is at a distance of about five miles up, where we don't know exactly what's happening to water vapor. By 1996, they say, water vapor remains a substantial uncertainty in climate models. <laughs> now this is the same group gradually learning over a period of six years that water vapor is a problem that they haven't solved. And it is the most important issue if you want to predict future temperatures. The problem is we don't have good data. And it will take some time before we accumulate the data of water vapor in the upper part of the atmosphere, about five miles and up. And until we do that, it will not be possible to make reliable predictions about temperature changes in the future. I think this is the only conclusion one can come to. And this conclusion is not just our own, but it's a conclusion that's also backed up by the uh, scientists who work on these problems. This is an interview, or these are interviews conducted by the Science Magazine, which is the leading scientific journal in the United States, perhaps in the world, of some of the scientists who worked in the IPCC report, who were lead authors. And they were interviewed and asked, hey, what do you really think? I know you can't read this. It was published in May 1997. It's quoted in the book, so you have it there. But I just want to read you the first two lines here. An international panel has suggested that global warming has arrived. But many scientists, and even scientists who worked on this report, these are not the so-called skeptics, or whatever you wish to call them, 
Many scientists say it will be a decade, or maybe longer, before computer models can confidently link the warming to human activity. Uh, look, this is a very difficult problem. Uh, you cannot fault these people for not having achieved their goal. It takes time. It takes good observations. It takes good models. We're not there yet. In 10 years, maybe we will be. Maybe in 20 years. There's a lot of good reasons why one should wait and get answers, reliable answers, before one takes action, precipitous action, that might have or might produce great economic harm. I'd just like to show you one more, one more thing. Uh, one of the big embarrassing facts about the climate has been this cooling that I mentioned earlier. The cooling between 1940 and 1975. How do you account for this cooling when greenhouse gases are increasing? Well, the IPCC, bless their little hearts, came up with a suggestion. They said, well, in addition to greenhouse gases, when you burn fuels, particularly coal, you create a lot of sulfur dioxide, or pollutant, which then creates aerosols. And aerosols are known to reflect sunlight back out into space and cause the cooling. And maybe the aerosol effects are strong enough to overcome the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide. At least so they argue. It's a very weak argument. But the experts in the field now really do not believe it. And perhaps the way to demonstrate this is to take a quote from the leading expert in the field, certainly the green promoter of global warming, Jim Hansen. And he said in an article, scientific article, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the forcings that drive long term climate change are not known with an accuracy sufficient to define future climate change. Well, what more do you need? This is a statement, this is a leading sentence in the abstract of this paper. So, I will tell you that the um, serious scientists in this field share the view that I've just expressed to you. In other words, they do not share the views that are expressed in newspapers, and they certainly don't share the views that are expressed by politicians or by the White House or by other administration sources. Or all the green groups. Or the green groups, right. Uh, in many cases, they're not willing to go public. But I think this interview that I've shown you and the statement that I've shown you uh, demonstrate that in private or in uh, discussions with scientists or in scientific publications, uh, they tend to be quite honest and straightforward. And now, I'd like to tell you uh, that they do speak sometimes, as they say in the, among Native Indians, with four terms. One of the uh, main conclusions, or I mean the only conclusion of the IPCC report is that there's some evidence, some evidence for a discernible influence, human influence on global climate. That's a very vague statement. I mean any almost anything you wanted to mean. It's very ambiguous. Let me show you what the IPCC report says, and I'll list the lead authors of that statement, associated with that statement. But at the same time, in the same year, some of the same people published in a scientific journal with an opposite conclusion. I don't know what to make of that. The chief author here was Benjamin Santa. A uh, gentleman who might have been here tonight, he was certainly invited, but he decided to turn down David's invitation. Uh, he just attacked us in print in a, in, a, in, a, in a scientific journal. So it's interesting, it would have been interesting to have had him here and have him listen to this discussion. But here's what Ben Santa and his colleagues, Wigley and Barnett, and so on, uh, we, we know these days very well, had to say in the IPCC report that there's evidence of an emerging pattern of climate response to forcings from greenhouse gases and sulfur aerosols. And they mentioned specifically the geographic distribution of patterns. And these results point towards the human influence on global climate. Yeah, there you have it. 
But at the same time, in the same year, the same, some of the same authors, Barnett, Santa, etc., in a, in a scientific journal called the Holocene, say, the estimates of natural variability are critical to the whole problem. And until we know what the natural variability is, we can't really say very much about whether there's a human influence. So it's hard to say with confidence that an anthropogenic climate signal has or has not been detected. Now this is an honest statement, and this I think is a statement for the politician. Made by the same people in the same year, <coughs> the week before. I'm sorry that these people are not here tonight, uh, because we might have an interesting debate, and they would, you would all enjoy this. Where does Santa work? It requires a little more radiation lab. Now, uh, let me know, since we're talking about Mr. Sanders, or Dr. Sanders, let me relate to you something which I think is a little even more reprehensible. The IPCC report, the one I showed you earlier, that was published in 1996, was approved for publication in December of 1995 conference in Rome, I was present. It was officially approved. The draft was distributed to everyone, including me, everyone else, and we all went home reasonably happy. Not completely, but reasonably happy. The, final, the report was then published, printed, in May of 1996. Between the time it was approved and the time it was printed, it was changed. It was scientifically cleansed. And the following sentences were taken out. This is quite easy to tell because we have a draft and we have a final printed report. And these sentences are missing. And you'll see that they're all phrases that are cautionary phrases. They really say, well, we really can't be sure that there's anything going on. We really can't be sure that there's human influence. <coughs> None of the studies said it above has shown clear evidence that we can, that we have a human influence. No study to date has positively identified all part of the climate change to anthropogenic or man-made causes. Any claims of positive detection of significant climate change are likely to remain controversial until we understand the natural variability. These are all correct statements. This, this, these statements were approved by the scientific group that wrote the report. And then these statements were removed before the report was printed without telling anybody. And our friend, uh, Mr. Sander, is responsible for this, has taken responsibility for making these editing changes, but he's not here tonight. And we should have insisted it more strongly. I would have enjoyed his response to this. Of course, he claims that we ruined his scientific reputation by publishing this. Yes, he received the, uh, this way, he received the MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, which I think is kind of, uh, kind of funny. Um, I think we're now ready to look at some of the consequences. The consequence that people are most concerned about, so I'm changing now from the scientific discussion of climate change to what are consequences of climate change. The consequences that people are concerned about are storms and hurricanes, and it's generally agreed now that there will be little change or any change if there's uh, one it should have no effect. That's on the, popular press the, most, the popular press is mostly concerned about sea level rise. Sea level rise is still a matter that people don't understand. And I'd like to point out to you that there's a logical error involved here. Let me see if I can convince you of this. First, the data. We always start with the scientific data. The scientific data on sea level are very direct. Forget the word amplitude. This is the, the relative position of sea level. And you see that sea level has been rising over the past century. And the rise in sea level is approximately seven inches per century. So sea level has risen about this much over the last hundred years. There's no argument about this. The data are not the very best. The data are obtained by a lot of tidal stations, tidal gauges around the world, 
they're not well distributed, all kinds, there are all kinds of problems about calibration. Uh, let me not go into that. This is the best that the scientific community has come up with after making all the corrections that are necessary. This is what scientists agree to. Sea level has risen seven inches in the last century. Okay? Now, let me show you again. Temperatures have increased in the last century. That's where they were a hundred years ago, here's where they are today. So, sea level has increased, temperatures have increased. Therefore, right? The temperature of Greece produced an increase of sea level, right? Wrong. Look, the divorce rate has increased in the last century. Could that be due to an increase in temperature? You can't, the correlation doesn't establish that this is the cause. So we cannot really assign this temperature rise as the cause for the sea level increase. And in fact, when we look into it in detail, we find that this is so. So I'll do this in two different ways. First, let me ask, why does sea level increase? Oh, water. When temperature rise. Either you put in more water into the ocean from the melting of glaciers, or the water expands because anything that warms expands, and therefore you get a rise in sea level without adding water. So for two reasons you would get a sea level rise. But also, and this is important, when the ocean warms, you get more evaporation. <laughs> and some of the evaporated water comes down the drain in the Antarctic and adds to the ice. So ice accumulates. And when ice accumulates in the Antarctic, it takes it from the ocean, so the sea level will fall. But which is more important? And the answer is we don't know until you look at the data. So you can't argue these things so to speak, ab initio. You can't sit back in your chair and sort of think about it and say which is more important. You've got to look at the data. You've got to measure the accumulation of ice in the Antarctic. You've got to calculate the effect of warming on the expansion of ocean water. You've got to measure glaciers and see how much of it melts and so on. That's all been done. And here are the results from the IPCC report. My great authority. I use it wherever I can. Because, you know, that shows that I'm not biased. First of all, here's the rise in sea level in the last century, 18 centimeters. You can see it. This, according to IPCC report, is the amount distributed, contributed by the thermal expansion of the ocean. This is the amount contributed by melting and glaciers. Greenland, it's a wash. <laughs> They don't get zero contribution. You get as much accumulation as you get melting. Antarctic, negative contribution. Um, the warming of the last century produced an accumulation of ice in the Antarctic. When you add them all together, you get this little bit here. Neglecting the errors for a moment, you see that this little bit here is only about 20% of what we observe. In other words, the physical processes that we know of cannot explain the global warming of the last century. Something's missing. What's missing? What's missing? Well, that's a puzzle. I puzzled over this. When I wrote this book, I knew that something was missing and I put it in there. I didn't know what was missing. During the last year, there have been two publications in science which tell us what's missing. And I'll show you what's missing. What's missing is the fact that the West Antarctic ice sheet, an ice sheet in the West, in the Antarctic, has been melting at a very rapid rate. And it has been melting since 15,000 years ago when the ice age stopped. In fact, sea level has risen by about 300 feet in the last 15,000 years. First, very rapidly, because you got the melting of the ice that was over North America and Scandinavia, and then more slowly, as the remaining ice melted. But nothing is still going on, in memory of the fact that the ice age has stopped. It's warmer now than 15,000 years ago, and the ice sheet in the West Antarctic remembers this. They don't, it doesn't forget. It's still melting. And here's the data, just published. 
by Conway and others in science, and it shows the position of the, what's called the grounding line, the place where the ice sheet meets the underlying Antarctic continent, and you see it's moving back with time. This is 15,000 years ago, this is 7,800, 6,800, 3,200, this is the present position. So the West Antarctic ice sheet is melted. Why? Because it's warmer now than it was 15,000 years ago. It will continue to melt. There's nothing we can do about this. We can't stop it. We can't influence it very much. It'll melt for another 7,000 years until it's gone, or until another ice age starts, and it'll stop melting. The important thing is, there's nothing we can do about this. It's melting has been going on now. Sea level has been rising at about the same rate, seven inches per century, for the last millennia. We have, we have the geologic data showing that sea level has been rising at the same rate, um, rain or shine, and it's continue to rise. Any attempt to influence it is like uh, you know King Canute trying to stop the tide. It's inexorable. So my advice is don't buy a beachfront property right now. Go a little inland, and in a few hundred years or a thousand years, you'll do very well. <laughs> you gotta figure out how to live that long, right? Yeah. Well, you don't have to. You know, wait for it. Let me show you just an interesting graph that was published in science. I like it very much. It shows what the Antarctic looked like 20,000 years ago, what it looks like today. I don't know if you can make this out. It's a little difficult. And the vertical scale has been exaggerated. Yeah. But 20,000 years ago, you had all this ice in the West Antarctic ice sheet. It's mostly gone now. And in 7,000 years, it'll be all gone. It'll all melt. This is a reconstruction by Winchandler, one of the experts, one of the glaciologists. Problem is, the glaciologists have never talked to the atmospheric scientists. And uh, I, being interested in this subject, I found the right references and can now reconstruct what actually happened and also can say what will happen in the future. <clears throat> now, you might ask the question what about these climate changes of the century? How do they affect sea level? Which is more important, in other words, the expansion of the ocean and melting of mountain glaciers or the accumulation of ice in the Antarctic? And I said earlier, if you don't know what, uh, which is more important until you look at the data, if you look at the book, you see that we've looked at the data, we get this following interesting result. That's a little technical, and you may, you may, it may be a little confusing, but let me try it anyway. <laughs> what we have here is during this century, between 19 and 1980, Global average temperature trotted downward, is this here, and sea level rise, with the, with the general rise taken out, is this curve here. And you see they match almost perfectly. What does this mean? It means that while sea level continues to rise, there are small fluctuations in the rate of rise. And when it warms, it decelerates, it slows down, the rate of rise slows down. And when it cools, the rate of rise increases. So when it warms between 1900 and 20 and 1940, the rate of rise decreased. When it cooled after 1940, the rate of rise of sea level increased. It shows that the Antarctic ice accumulation dominates slightly over the other factors, the factors that raise sea level. I don't want to belabor this point too much, but I would just like to mention that global warming, whether it's human produced or whether it's natural, will slightly slow down the ongoing rise of sea level. Not speed it up, slow it down. And finally, turn now to the economic effects of warming. And I want to be fairly quick about this. This is not my work. The, this is the work of uh, 26 uh, expert economists, uh, led by a uh, regional economist from Yale University, Bob Mendelssohn. They published their work in a book last year, 
published by the Cambridge University Press, a very prestigious press. By the way, the same press that published the ICC report, there's some irony in this, and they came up with the opposite conclusion of the IPCC. The IPCC concluded that global warming is bad for you. And this group of economists, after careful study, came up with the conclusion that global warming is good for you. Why? Well, in detail, and I apologize for all these numbers, but in detail, they show, let me just tell, pick up agriculture. They show instead of the previous estimate showing a loss of between 1 and 8 billion, 18 billion, there would actually be a gain of 11 billion. So it certainly is better for agriculture. It is also better for timber resources. Instead of a loss of 1 to 44 billion, which is what the IPCC estimate showed, as a gain of 3 billion. Let me just skip down to the GNT. Instead of a loss of about 0.3 to 1.2 percent, there would be a gain of 0.2 percent. Just the reverse of what the IPCC concluded. This is a consequence of the fact that warming generally is better for agriculture and forest, and the increased CO2 makes things grow faster. This work has been published, as I say in the book, in other forms, and the table that you just saw, this review table, is in the, the book, uh, the revised edition of, of the book that published by the Independent Institute. Well, the last thing I'd like to show is the effect of the Kyoto Protocol. You might ask, supposing we go ahead and ratify the protocol and do everything that's required by the protocol, which is to cut drastically our emission of carbon dioxide by all industrializations, according to the protocol, and observe punctiliously what is required, what, will it ha what effect will this have on climate? Well, uh, let's take the year 2050, 50 years from now, uh, the hypothesized hypothetical climate, the temperature increases 1.4 degrees centigrade. These are IPCC data. All the calculations are done by the IPCC. Here you see the increase will be 1.4 degrees in the year 2050. With the Kyoto Protocol in existence, you have this, this curve here. There will be a decrease in temperature. The decrease will be 0 0.05 degrees. You cannot even measure this. It's very small. The effect is minute. It's virtually indetectable. But the impact of the Kyoto Protocol on our economy would be very severe indeed. <coughs> According to estimates by the Department of Energy, our Department of Energy, it would be a 4% decrease in GNP. Loss of jobs for manufacturing industries as they move overseas, uh, it would have a, a huge uh, impact. Even the green organizations admit that the Kyoto Protocol won't achieve anything. They say it's an important first step. What we really need is a 10 Kyoto Protocol, not just a 5% reduction or 7% reduction in emissions, but a 60 to 80% reduction. 10 Kyoto Protocol is what's needed to stabilize greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. This, again, according to IPCC data. Well, uh, why is all this going on? There are many, many strands. Uh, people are motivated in many different ways, ranging from uh, idealistic ways, people who really believe they'll save the world from disaster, to people who have uh, obvious uh, financial interests in this, but in between, you have people who are motivated by various strange ideologies. I'd just like to show you the quote of the head of the IPCC science group that produced the scientific report, John Houghton, a British uh, atmospheric physicist who was knighted for his efforts by Margaret Thatcher. Sorry to say that. Here is his interview. 
See what motivates them. Such policies, like cutting energy use by more than 50%, can contribute powerfully to the material salvation of the planet from mankind's greed and indifference. I get very nervous when people talk about salvation. It becomes very theological. You can see what's driving it. He's basically interested in cutting energy use. He thinks people are impinging on nature. It's, uh, it's a, a weird type of theological reasoning that uh, many of us really cannot follow. And then you have people who have uh, uh, purely, uh, so to speak, anti, anti-industrial, anti-capitalistic interests. Uh, many of the green organizations believe in this. Friends of the Earth, for example, uh, came up with this wonderful poster. I really love it. It shows uh, the oil industry manipulating Mr. Clinton and Mr. Gore. Here they are, the two dummies being manipulated by big oil. Big oil. If you can believe that. But then, of course, you have uh, organizations that have an opposite point of view. And I particularly like uh, an organization made up of students who came up with a wonderful slogan in our meeting we had in Buenos Aires over a year ago. The t-shirts, in fact, that you could buy, uh, they distributed uh, and uh, it's not people free, uh, which went like this. <laughs> I think this is probably a good place for me to stop. I thank you for your attention. Be very happy. Um, if there are any questions, uh, Carl has a mic, and if you could just wait a second, and happy to <coughs> check. Check. Hopefully, you have it. Okay. Uh, how about the gentleman in the aisle right there? Fred, mm-hmm. Fred uh, do you have a uh, comment on the potential effects of high uh, altitude aircraft on uh, this whole issue? Uh, high altitude of the aircraft have a potential effect, which has not been taken into account in the IPCC model. Uh, the air traffic is increasing at the rate of 5% per year, probably faster than anything else that, was, that, that is going on in the world today. All the planes are becoming more efficient, too. So, um, yeah, take that into account. Yes, uh, this is true to some extent, but I'm really referring now to the emission of gases. Uh, this is a study by NASA. Uh, I summarized it again in the book. And you'll see that the emissions from aircraft is concentrated primarily at northern mid latitude, at altitudes between 10 and 12 kilometers, so roughly at about 7 miles. Um, the effects of this emission are problematic. Now, I uh, believe that they could have an effect. I believe that it is possible that the, that the increases, the decreasing air traffic, will have a regional climate effect that leads to a regional warming. And uh, I'm looking for data now to back this up, so this has not yet been published in uh, what I would call uh, a form ready to be refereed. We're still looking for data. But this is one of the human effects that is very possible, uh, and uh, we're, looking to, we're looking at it very seriously. Oh, we're right up in front here. Uh, about uh, uh, January or February the 23rd to the 26th at the Commonwealth Club, there will be a presentation in one of the sections by someone who is president of one of the groups that says things opposite from you. Could you quickly tell me the points she might say in opposition to what you have given? Namely, is she going to disagree with your data? Is she going to ignore it? Uh, will she say something that you haven't said? Can you tell me quickly so I don't have to go to her meeting? <laughs> it depends. We, we find that our opponents uh, try to use ad hominem attacks. Uh, they try to, uh, rather than deal with the scientific data and engage in the scientific debate, they prefer to try to discredit uh, 
those who dis disagree with them. Uh, they do this in various ways. One way is to say that the overwhelming majority agrees with their point of view, and that those of us, like me, who disagree are a tiny minority of naysayers. Or to put it in the words of Al Gore, uh, those of us, the skeptics, as he calls them, are the ones who equate global warming to the empirical equivalent of the Easter Bunny, his words. So we're the Easter Bunny advocates. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. Uh, I can give you uh, statements from the Association of State Climatologists who support our, our view. The president of the Association of State Climatologists certainly does. Uh, a large group of weather meteorologists, of TV meteorologists, has uh, adopted a point of view. Uh, it, it, you might say the cream of the crop of the American Meteorological Society has signed a statement supporting our point of view. An international group has signed something called the White Sea Declaration, which supports our point of view, about 100 climate scientists. About 17,000 17, scientists have signed a petition opposing the global climate change, the Kyoto Accord. This appeared in the New York Times last uh, two years ago. So, the, the public has not learned of this. The newspapers do not quote these statements. These are people who have been willing to sign their names to an anti Kyoto statement. They're not anonymous. They're well known. About two thirds of these people are, uh, we know have advanced degrees in science. That's relevant to the climate issue. So I think you'll find that our opponents will use this argument. The argument of scientific consensus. There's a scientific consensus except for a few naysayers. That's completely wrong. Yeah, and then, of course, there were cures of being in the tail, the oil industry, the coal industry, the uh, river, moon, the rouge, the communist, <laughs> whoever, whoever is handy. Yeah. Uh, another question. How about the gentleman in the back there? Yes. Um, we have the honor of having Dr. Schneider. Yes, um, I teach at San Jose State, and we had Dr. Schneider about a year ago, and I asked him about the triplicate. This is uh, Professor Steve Schneider from Steve Stanford. Stanford, right. right. And um, he's on the other side of the debate. And I, I asked him about the triplicate um, redundant data on satellites, uh, radio sons, and the uh, pressure-derived temperatures from radio sons, to which he responded, well, there was problems with satellite data. He said, oh, it's been corrected for the slight decay in orbit, and he couldn't answer that. And if, as you say, he had launched into a polemic. Uh, well, he said... My enemies are, 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 uh, are very much polemic on the, on the uh, subject and then launch them into ad hominem attacks immediately. So I'd like to take this time to uh, invite you to San Jose State if you'd like to set some of these students straight uh, on some of this. Get a few hundred, hundred of them at a time in the auditorium. So you don't have a question? Um, I was confirming with the... Uh, oh, okay. Maybe you know the way to stand up there. Well, the gentleman right there in the beard. Uh, uh, Stephen Schneider, uh, I think needs, somebody needs to quote him, his, the statement he made in Discovery magazine back in 1989, in which he said, we who are right thinkers have to lie about what we're, about the, the fact of global warming, because otherwise we can't influence policy. I mean, he, 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 so he did make the statement, but he would prefer now not to be reminded of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's very unkind of you to remind him of it. <laughs> yeah, he did. Well, the Which question I had, however, is this: uh, It seems to me that the global warming flap is a uh, is an example of a larger problem, which is that for a long time now, ever since Silent Spring, we've had a whole series of fake crises. We've had the the, the population bomb and, and limits to growth, and the energy crisis, and, and nuclear winter, and and the, the coming ice age, and now global warming. And all of these have eventually gone away, pretty much, except they all leave things behind. You know, we still don't use DDT, we still have a Department of Energy. And, and uh, the question is, is this something we just have to live with? Or is there some way we can stop this nonsense and, uh, and, and get a more critical view of, of fake science of this kind? Well, 
my answer to this is uh, that I'm often asked what the uh, we often face with what's called a precautionary principle. Uh, so let me address this, which is um, if we don't know what we're doing, shouldn't we be doing something? <laughs> <laughs> because you know we never know. Maybe maybe there's some surprise that you can't predict. Which is for pathology, but you never can predict surprises. That's one of the great things about a surprise. You can't predict it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to show you. The file which I happen to have here, in readiness, because I was waiting for this kind of a discussion, and I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, whom we shall call Ed. I hope you can see this. I'll raise it up, so we're pretty higher. Well, I can't raise it up, I'm sorry. You know, give me something else. Thank you. I'll, I'll take care of it. The funny thing was, last week I gave a talk to Ron Page, and there was a guy taking the front of the name of Ed. <laughs> and he enjoyed it very much. But anyway, Ed was a regular guy, uh, and uh, he worried about the greenhouse effect and about the ozone layer. I don't know why it's called it, but you know, this a cartoonist who can always take liberties with the science. <laughs> and uh, about, he worried about foul, foul beaches and pesticides and food. Here we go. And finally, we decided that the world was too dangerous to place. So, he decided he wouldn't go out. And he stayed home. Never went out again. He stayed home. And then the radar got him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's something to this. We're constantly faced with risks. And we cannot take precautions against all risks. We have to intelligently evaluate risks. And we have to use our resources to protect against the most important risks. I would judge that greenhouse warming is not an important risk. Being born is an important risk. I mean, after all, once you're born, you almost certainly stand the risk of, of dying. <laughs> so, once you've taken the step of being born, you're exposed to that risk. And every other risk has to be measured in relation to that. <laughs> Greenhouse warming is not a risk uh, to be concerned about. How about up on the right here, Carl? <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to follow up, I think, on the last question. Uh, basically, I, I, think, I think there's some body of, of uh, controversy here, some room for controversy. I'm sure you, you wouldn't agree to that, but, but there is a controversy raging out there on this issue. And there's some group of people who say, well, why don't we take some steps to deal with this in a no regrets policy, meaning that let's, let's, cut, um, let's promote energy, or energy efficiency, Let's promote measures that, in fact, will help our economy at the same time that it takes us away from, in other words, we're not, we don't cut back on automobile use for three days instead of seven days, but we'll, we'll drive five times as far as we do on the same tank of gas. Why shouldn't we take those sort of steps? And what about, you, you kind of, you imply in your, your thought that, in fact, the only way to, to deal with this or the only way to deal with the critics, uh, the way of seeing this is actually a freeze in the dark or to you know, drive less or things like that. In fact, there's all kinds of scientific evidence and engineering evidence that we can, in fact, do what we do now, but we just do a lot more efficiently. No, I completely agree with you. I believe that uh, we should be more efficient. And my own record has been that we, in writing, is that we should not waste energy. I have uh, Jack Hall here, I've done policy papers for him to say this. Uh, if you look at the book, it advocates a no regret policy. Uh, it, you have to be sensible about energy conservation. By this I mean, supposing you had a chance to get a more efficient refrigerator, would you jump the present one, or would you wait until it wears out, and then install a new one? And you have to recognize the fact that if you buy capital equipment, 
refrigerators, cars, and so on. There's energy involved in manufacturing of things. So uh, you have to balance that against uh, uh, when you do when you turn over capital equipment. Just a detailed uh, decision. Uh, my rule of thumb is that you should do this if you can recover your energy savings in a period of three years or less. In five years or less. Depends on how you feel about it. Everybody has his own interest rate. If, the, if it's ten years or more, you should think very seriously about dunking your car or refrigerator or, or like pulling down your house and building a new one. You see what I mean? Right, so you agree that not, not only it's not just a matter of the choice of having less. Right? Oh, of course. Oh, of course, yes. I'm a it's strong not. advocate in all my writing of great efficiency in cars. I'm a big believer in hybrid, or uh, on hybrid electric cars. I think that there's a car in the future, uh, with roughly two or three times the efficiency of the electric cars. Um, but also that, uh, that's it. Uh, in my lifetime, for example, uh, power plants, electric power plants have grown from 35% efficiency to about 60% efficiency. And with, uh, coal generation, they can probably go to 80% efficiency. With fuel cells, they might even go a little higher. Because we use the heat generated by the cells. So I see tremendous improvement in store for us in energy efficiency. And these things take time. They cannot be done overnight because you cannot afford to scrap the present capital equipment. You waste energy if you do that. Having said all these things, I will tell you that we run into personal problems. And family. They don't do what I want to do. They don't turn up the lights. They don't turn up the heat. Uh, she drives to the store three times a day to pick up something you forgot. I get very upset about that. So I'm, I'm liable to able to not, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I'm, I'm dealing about energy saving. Uh, we have a real problem. I have a real problem with the younger generation. They don't think the way I do. And uh, I'm considered to be really out of step. So I'm glad to hear that I consider you. Well, that is of the younger generation I uh, should be thinking in that direction. There is, in fact, a very good government effort underway. Uh, some of you may know Art Rosenfeld, who worked here at Berkeley, uh, had, had led an uh, effort in energy conservation, and then moved to Washington and carried these forward. Well, those, those are very sensible things. But we certainly could support. Oh, and may, um, one thing I might add is uh, many of us are interested specifically in market-based approaches to different environmental issues. Some of you may have been here a couple weeks ago, and that's, in our opinion, one of the important ways to be able to calculate these kinds of questions is that you don't have um, government policies imposing costs or decisions, but instead you have market prices in which then you can make decisions um, in ways that actually will produce the outcomes that are being sought. Uh, another question. Um, what it is uh, heartwarming to hear that the U.S. Senate got it right on this issue, and a bit of a surprise. Um, given that so many people in high places uh, have got it right, why is the press in the United States uh, almost completely aligned on the other side? That's a very good question. Uh, the media have been have some of you can answer this, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, the world's greatest expert on media, I say something else, but I'll speak up. The media likes stories to uh, give bad news, that that sells papers. They, if yeah, if the media would say, well, uh, you know, it's not a serious problem, what page would that go into? Page 835? But you can say the world is coming to an end because of global warming. That's page one. That sells news. That's, that's part of it. That may be a large part of it, but there's also... Um, I think they're motivated by the feeling uh, that uh, industrial civilization is somehow bad. Uh, don't forget that the uh, people who write the newspapers are really pretty well off. They don't worry about the everyday uh, problems of life that uh, low-income people worry about. So they have a chance to, uh, to think about uh, well, how, how wonderful it would be if we could go back to a simpler life of less energy, less transportation, immoral, you know, you mm -hmm. think about the good old days of 200 years ago, life expectancy was 30 years, people got sick, you know, it, 
it's hard to fathom what drives them. But I think that, that much of this, much of this is that. Bill Stevens of the New York Times has just written a terrible book. Unfortunately, <coughs> it's selling well. <laughs> he calls today, he wants to get back and sort of interview the skeptics and find out what drives them. We'll be glad to tell him. <laughs> Um, my, my question is uh, in regards to, there's controversy here, have both parties agreed to what type of data needs to be collected, say over the next 10, 15, 20 years, that we might uh, settle the debate, or and what type of uh, technology may have to be developed to capture that data? Um, yes, I think there's good agreement there. Yeah. Um, I think we are reasonably, reasonably well agreed on that. Um, and as you pointed out, Unfortunately, you can't speed the process. It takes time to gather the data. And you cannot uh, do ten times as much data gathering and, and do it all in one year. It takes ten years, no matter how you do it. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, people tend to, now I'm happy to say, tend more satellites, more sophisticated instruments, uh, because they realize that the only global data that and really good pain is, is through satellites. And also this it's an economic way of obtaining this data. One more question. Um, let's see. <laughs> oh, right in the front. Uh, environmentalists tend to talk in terms of what I call a, a non-falsifiable uh, hypothesis when they talk about global warming. In other words, they say if it, if it gets really hot, that's evidence of global warming, and also if it gets really cold, that's more evidence of global warming. If it's really rainy, that's global warming. If it's really dry, that's evidence of global warming. So, I mean, nothing can happen that won't imply global warming. And I think that's what they call a non-falsifiable hypothesis. I mean, there's no thing that can happen. And I was always wondering, what, if you ever asked one of them, what would be the symptoms of global cooling? <laughs> but have you ever come across this non-falsifiable, I mean, Al Gore is, Yes, today, quite a bit of that. today I got an email uh, from a colleague, uh, a Reuters report, uh, that the uh, hijacking of the plane to Afghanistan was due to global warming. <laughs> oh, that I think is a, a new, novel theory, and I've never seen that put forward before. Unfortunately, there was not enough detail to understand why this is so. But this was reported on the BBC. Uh -huh. Reported on the BBC. what? The hijacking of the Indian plane to Afghanistan was due to global warming. The people who were apparently fleeing global warming or something of the sort, but it was due to global warming, and that was reported on the BBC. So I think that will, I'm a, we'll have to have you ask it. We're actually going over time, I'm afraid. Okay, real quick. I don't know if you're not up here, but the chart was I'm just asking about the chart of the Kyoto Plan, and it only covered like 50 or 100 years. I was just wondering if you knew where it was going to, you know, because that could end up in, say, a thousand years being significant. I was just wondering if you knew where the data was. talking about the temperature chart, you went up to 19... Um, 90, and then you said from that point on, you're going to talk about that in depth. Well, <coughs> I, I, I showed the chart up to 1980. Right. After 1980, we now have satellite data. Well, no, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, the, the straight lines. The straight lines. You said it made no difference in 1950 years. No, I just wondered if you had data for. Well, the Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, those are not data. Those are projections right. Right. Okay. based on quite unrealistic estimates of carbon dioxide emissions. And unrealistic, I think unrealistic climate models. But what I wanted to show is that even if you hypothesize that this is a correct temperature curve, correct projection, the effect of the Kyoto Protocol on this would be minute. Yeah. In a hundred years, it would be somewhat greater, but still very, very small. Okay, I guess that will be our last question. Um, I want to thank Fred Singer for his wonderful presentation. <laughs> For those of you who, who haven't uh, seen the book or if you know of people who are interested in this issue, 
Of course, we're obviously biased, but we honestly believe that this really is the finest treatment in a condensed form uh, of the many issues relating to this. I want to thank everyone for joining with us, uh, for making this such a successful evening. We hope that you'll be joining with us again. Uh, there are additional copies of the book upstairs, and for those of you who have not um, had your book autographed, Fred would be happy to do so. Thank you for joining with us. Good night. Thank you.